uh, uh, I had with uh, two students of mine, uh, Roy Ben Israel and Lior Liram, and with Amit Givon, and some works with you. Okay, so uh, uh, we are kind of used to the fact that we uh, have a lot uh, to learn about quantum. I'm not doing this one. I should do it like this. Okay. Maybe not. I should just not breathe and then it's perfect. Well, I can go 40 minutes without breathing. Okay, so um, yes, so we are used to the fact that we have a lot to learn about uh, black holes at the quantum level. And, but we uh, definitely would like to think that classically we understand black holes. And in particular, we know, we just know that the horizon is smooth, we can fall through it, and everything is okay. And basically in this talk, what I would like to do is to uh, share with you my confusion about classical black holes in uh, string theory. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so a probing, actually, yes, probing uh, uh, short distances by going to um, high energy is standard. And the same goes for uh, at least eternal black holes, I would uh, argue here. Um, so the point would be that from the uh, reflection coefficient that an observer, so this is my uh, limited ability. You can, so this is supposed to be the black hole and that's a singularity and we have an incoming wave and a reflected wave. And so from the reflection coefficient, I would try to argue that we can learn about the singularity of the black hole and if this is correct, then this is both uh, surprising and uh, interesting. It's interesting because it means that an observer that uh, lives at infinity can study the things that happen uh, behind the horizon. And it is especially interesting uh, in string theory because in string theory, the only thing that we know how to do are basically things that live at infinity either scattering amplitudes or, um, you know, correlation functions in IDS, things like that. Um, yes, so this is, uh, of course, surprising. Uh, first of all, um, because as we, so uh, the point will be that I go to very high energy, but as I go to very high energy, most of the wave um, is getting absorbed by the black hole and there is just a tiny bit of reflected wave. And it is uh, also surprising, of course, because the singularity is shielded by the horizon, so we are not supposed to know anything about it by causality, basically. So, uh, yes, so uh, this point is making the claim that I'm about to make out to believe, and this other point makes it basically impossible to believe, but uh, there is a symmetry in the problem, and that symmetry will uh, hopefully convince you that we can do that, and then we'll see what happens. So yes, so the plan of the talk is as follows. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the symmetry, and I'll show how we can use it to, to, to make this uh, uh, relationship between the reflection coefficient and the singularity of the black hole. And then I'll use it um, for black holes in GR, black holes in perturbative string theory, and black holes in exact, um, string in ex in exact classical string theory, uh, namely the SL2 uh, module 1. So there is SL2 in this talk, so that's good. Um, so this is, of course, what I care about. And these two will just be uh, sanity checks that you know, this machinery that I'm uh, proposing is actually, it makes sense. Okay, so, um, yes, so let's, uh, let's first talk about a tortoise coordinate, just to uh, remind ourselves what it is. So we all know the Kruskal coordinates, usually we denote them by U and V, they cover this Penrose diagram. The horizons are at U times um, V equals zero. So these two lines, 
Uh, the total S coordinates, well, that's X, I, X uh, T is the usual Schwarzschild time. So it goes like this. And X is a uh, defined uh, some uh, coefficient times log of u times v. And uh, this is uh, the so-called so total coordinate. What is so, so it works, it, it goes like that. Uh, x goes to infinity, that's uh, the asymptotic region. X goes to minus infinity, that would be the, uh, the horizon. As you can see from this, uh, just plugging zero here, you get uh, minus infinity. Okay, so what is nice about uh, using this uh, coordinates is that um, yes, is that uh, if you look on the wave equation in this background now using uh, t and x, then it looks just like a Schrodinger equation, and this makes our life uh, very easy when we try to understand what the reflection coefficient uh, actually uh, means. So we have this uh, setup, um, we throw something, there is a potential, there is a smooth potential, um, it dies off both at plus and minus infinity. Um, as I said, most of the wave just falls in, some of it gets reflected by the potential. And um, normally, we, uh, it's, it's a, it's a difficult a task to find the exact reflection coefficient given, given the potential. But uh, as I will try to uh, show you now, uh, it's not an ordinary, well, it's an ordinary potential in, in the sense that it's smooth, but it has some hidden symmetry in it. And I will first uh, show you what the symmetry is, and then we'll, we'll use it to calculate or to say something about the reflection coefficient. Okay, so this is the definition of X. Uh, from that definition, and also the time definition that I don't write here, you can see that when, uh, you, when we add uh, I beta to X, we stay in this region. When we add uh, I beta over 2 to X, we go from 1 to 3. And when we add I beta over 4, we go from I to 2 or 4, depending on uh, what you do with the time coordinate as well. So uh, from this, since this region looks just like that one, it means that the potential must have this uh, symmetry. Okay, so that's, uh, you, you have a symmetry which is basically shift, but not in, um, not in a real X, but you add some uh, imaginary power to it and you go back to the same potential. So that's that's a general. Um, prop. What's that? Which one? This, this x? Yes. All right. So it doesn't. It covers only region one. If you add to it this, then you go, you go from. It covers region one when x is real, but if you add to it a constant, um, imaginary part, which is i beta over two, then you go to region three. Well, it is equal, and that's why you have that symmetry. If you don't like, I look, if you don't like going from one to, to three, you can use this one and add i beta. That would be good enough. Y you don't really need to go to three. Sorry, what's that? Well, the assumption is that it's, it's a function of u and v. There are no uh, fractional powers of u and v. The Kruskal coordinates. That's the assumption. OK, so, so that's the problem that we have now. We have this potential with this property, and we want to know how to calculate the reflective coefficient at high energies. So at high energies, since I have a smooth potential, I can use the Born approximation. And uh, in one dimension, I get an expression like that up to factors that I don't try to. Um, OK, so now if I want to calculate this uh, and I want to take advantage of this, what I will do is I will consider that um, 
integral over a curve that looks like so, and these are supposed to be at uh, minus and plus infinity. If you look, if you just do this integral, then, so normally you would gain nothing by doing this, but now um, if you go, if you do the integral here, you get the same answer as the integral there, up to a minus sign and a factor that comes from that exponent. Okay, so uh, if you uh, use now the residue theorem, you get that uh, the reflection coefficient that you want to get uh, times this factor is equal to the sum over all the residues that you have, and if you have a branch cut, then you have to work out the branch cut, uh, etc. Okay. So, uh, so these were the uh, problems that we had with the, the with the idea that we can relate the reflection coefficient to the um, to the potential behind the to the um, singularity. But now we see, uh, you know, a relation like that evades these issues roughly because what we, we can do, is we use the, the symmetry just to surround the singularity and then we use the uh, residue theorem. So, um, so what I would like to do now um, is to use uh, this relationship for various cases and see, and see what, what I get. So if I go to high energies, I can forget about this term. So, Costas, so if I didn't do, if I did what you wanted me to do, I would have gotten here at a factor of two, but since I throw this away, it doesn't really matter. It's the, the, you get the same thing, but you don't have to have a factor of two. We can talk about it. Anyways, so uh, the first case that I want to, um, to discuss is the SL2 module one black hole but just at the level of uh, GR, um, we know the potential. This is the potential when I write it in terms of um, this uh, total coordinate. And uh, well, this is how, well, you have a singularity uh, here because of the minus sign that I get when I add to X the right uh, uh, imaginary part. Sorry? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Well, it is, it's maybe like the square root of 2k or something like that. Well, I'll have it there in a second. Yes, sorry. Well, right, but for that, yes. But for that, I need to have the shift symmetry, uh, this shift symmetry, otherwise I won't get this. If I have a generic potential, I won't, yes. Yes, 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 sure. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, okay, so uh, I have here my uh, uh, singularity, and so this is region one, this is region two, and that line is living in region two, sorry, this is region three, and that line is living in region two. It goes like this, and that point is that point. So I can use this equation now, and what I get is that the reflection coefficient uh, is e to the minus uh, beta uh, p over two, and that's uh, beta. Okay, okay so, uh, so this is, uh, this is consistent with the exact uh, reflection coefficient that is known for that case. It's not for that case because you can use the SL2 structure uh, even without knowing the potential. Okay, so this is just to show that things work. The other case that I wish to uh, discuss briefly is the uh, Schwarzschild black hole in four dimensions. This is a bit more interesting because now here, here uh, we know the potential, but the reflection coefficient is something that people got uh, confused about, and there are some kind of uh, wrong statements in uh, the literature. Uh, so, uh, uh, so now the, the point is that uh, the singularity uh, looks just like in SL2 module one in Schwarzschild black hole. It 
This is exactly the kind of potentials that we uh, heard about yesterday with the conformal symmetry. Um, and from that, immediately we learned that the reflection coefficient at high energies must, must look like just like in SO2 uh, module 1. Now, um, case 2 prime is basically any black hole in GR. And these methods allow you to calculate things that people, as far as I can tell, don't know uh, how to calculate in GR. So I'm not going to discuss cases here because I wish to do something which is more stringy. And that would be to add uh, perturbative alpha prime corrections to uh, a, a non-supersymmetric SL2 module 1 black hole. Okay, so we still have the same uh, beta, but uh, Dijkraaf and the Verlinders uh, long ago um, studied that, um, that black hole, and they found that the reflection coefficient uh, looks like so. Uh, so instead of having this expression, we have this famous shift in K or in with K from K to K minus 2 that doesn't happen here, but does happen here at the reflection coefficient. So we can see what this means about the uh, potential. Okay, so we can write that reflection coefficient as if we had the usual thing that we got times uh, uh, an exponent with epsilon that is fairly small when k is large. So Yes. Right, right. Uh, yes, quasi, uh, so uh, quasi normal modes, you need to take, of course, P to be imaginary. There are, thi there are things that can be said about this, but uh, I'm not going there right now. Uh, okay, so, um, yes, uh, so, uh, so before we had singularity here, and remember that we have an expression like that, and that that factor came from this exponent here when x has the imaginary part. But uh, now we have a shift like this. And what this means is really is that that point, the singularity moved a little bit up here. And it moved by a distance of the order of 1 over square root of k. So uh, naively, that's sounds a bit strange because if I take k to be very large, then that distance is very small in stringy units. But actually, if you look at the invariant distance, uh, let's not talk about the other point here, but we need the other point. There is this other point which is needed for because of the uh, reality of the potential, but we can ignore it right now. So. Uh, the point that is uh, interesting is that the distance that it moved is order one in stringy units, the invariant distance, and this is exactly as it should be, because we are adding alpha prime corrections. It doesn't matter how large k is. If I go a stringy distance from the singularity, then something should happen, and this is what happens. Okay, so. Um, so we are kind of uh, done with the uh, sanity checks. And uh, the next uh, exactly thing that I wish to, uh, to discuss is the exact classical SL2 module 1 black hole. And for simplicity, I'll go back to the supersymmetric case, which is much cleaner. And we don't have to do this uh, shift, but we can do the non-supersymmetric uh, case as well. Right, there, yes, exactly. There is no shift. Yes, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, yes, so, so we don't expect big news, and naively we don't get big news. Uh, actually, the reflection coefficient looks something like that. And Micha told us uh, an hour ago that phases are something that we shouldn't worry about, but we will. And we would, l we would like to see what a phase like this, uh, so you see that the phase here depends on p. Uh, and we would like to see what uh, it, uh, it does to the uh, potential. So if we had 
a phase that was just at large p would become a some constant times p, then it would mean that the singularity, instead of being here, would have uh, shifted to the left or to the right, depending on the sign of the this constant. But actually, a Teschner, a Teschner calculated this phase uh, long ago, I think in 98 or something like that. And this is what he found. He found that that uh, uh, phase is the ratio of two gamma functions. Um, and if you look, if you go to I energies, then it means that this uh, phase is some constant times p times log of p. Okay, so it, it's not a constant times the momentum, but it keeps on going. And that's, that's uh, I would <coughs> try to argue, is a big deal, because what it means is that as I increase p, that point keep, keep on moving to the left, and recall that this is the horizon this from the inside. That's the horizon from the outside, and that's the horizon from the inside. Okay, so the singularity is being basically pushed to the, uh, sorry, being pushed to the, uh, to the horizon. Um, so uh, since it depends on, on P, you, what you, you have is basically a branch cut here, and you can calculate the details of that uh, branch cut so you can basically calculate what is the nest, what is the needed uh, uh, discontinuity in the potential, what is the discontinuity in the potential along that line, what it should be, so that you get this exact answer that uh, Teschner found, and this is what you get. The discontinuity is some Bessel function, and, um, which uh, oscillates. But what's what's more important is that you have your e to the minus x times square root of k, okay? Th that's the only way. Uh, I don't think that there is. Well, I, well we can uh, talk about this because, w so what, what you can do, the previous cases, what you can uh, uh, do there is you could, um, you could say, well, I have some discontinuity here, and from the, dis and and you can ask yourself, what, I what is the discontinuity say that will give you the, the answer of uh, Schwarzschild? Okay? And you get uh, something like um, a derivative of a delta function. And then you ask yourself, what kind of a potential will give you the derivative of delta function? And it gives you exactly the potential that uh, we know. So I think that this way of doing the calculation is really, th that's the more general way. And you see that in this case, it not only that there is something here, but it blows up as you approach, as you approach the singularity. It blows uh, as you approach the horizon. It blows up like that. So that, of course, I see. I'm assuming. Yes. So I'm assuming. Yes. So I'm assuming that uh, a shredding. So yes. So I. I expected that just like in the perturbative alpha prime correction thing, instead of having something which is fixed here, I would get something that is smeared a string a distance away from that, but apparently it's not. So all other corrections are, the reason why it works so well in the perturbative alpha prime correction is that all the perturbative alpha prime corrections are such that they are very small here, and they become important only when you approach the singularity. Yes, so right. So, so the logic here is that I'm assuming that uh, nothing um, dramatic happens at the horizon. And then I'm asking, is this, th that assumption is consistent or not? And apparently, well, Unless we made a mistake, it doesn't appear to be the case. Okay, so yes, yeah, so basically what Micha said is, uh, so this, these are the assumptions that I made. Um, yes, so, so I made the assumption, of course, of Teschner's result, but you know, it's, it's very hard to see. I think, w so he got his results using an the bootstrap approach, 
and people got it using many other approaches. It's very, it's very hard to imagine that there is something wrong there. Uh, the point that Micha made was basically, which is uh, a good question, it does a, a V captures correctly the structure of the singularity. It might be that we are missing something there. There is this third assumption that in my mind is uh, the most interesting one, which is that the horizon is regular from the outside. So how much time do I have time, right? I have time. So, okay, so, so let me, uh, in that case, talk about that because um, um, this is an assumption that I made and I'm not sure that I can uh, test it right now. So, um, so basically, the situation that we found is that there is, uh, behind the horizon, th there is a potential that goes like that. So if you uh, dare to go in, then that is your fate. But we assume that uh, outside the potential is very, very smooth. So we have a, po we have a, a potential like that. Uh, uh, we made that assumption when we used the uh, Born approximation. But it's possible that actually the potential looks something more like that. You have wiggles that, be that don't go up this is all outside. You have wiggles that don't go up. So if, I, if I'm traveling here, then I, I'm not aware of all of that. There is structure here, highly non-trivial, which is very different than in GR. But uh, an infalling observer, a cross-grained infalling observer, is not sensitive to all of that. Of course, if you are a quantum fellow that like to live somewhere here, then you are aware of that. But, you know, a massive object is just not aware of all of that, and it will fall through. And the question is whether such a thing can fix, you know, this disaster. Uh, this is a possibility. Um, this is a possibility. And um, unfortunately, so, so, so here is a, so concretely, um, can we tell if this is the case or not? Um, and the, um, the way to do that is to study not only the reflection coefficient, but also the transmission coefficient. And the fact that the potential is smooth means the T should go to one when you go to the UV, which is not the case when you have these kind of oscillations that I uh, discussed. So um, this is, of course, the case in GR and also in perturbative alpha prime, when perturbative alpha prime corrections are taken into account. But we don't have the analog of what Teschner did for the reflection coefficient for T. And the reason is that the calculation that he did was done in a Euclidean ADS tree. And in Euclidean ADS tree, we just we have R, but we don't have T. So we really don't know if this is the case or it's not. And this is something uh, that I think is very, would be actually very interesting to know the answer to that question. So, uh, so yes, so, so this is, uh, so I would like to conclude with this uh, question. So uh, how can we have a structure at a classical horizon, whether it is outside or inside, after all, we really don't expect to have something at a classical, uh, filthy, at a classical uh, level. And of course, one possible answer is that we don't, and that you know I've cheated somewhere or I just made a mistake somewhere. It's not the one that you suggested. <laughs> uh, another possibility is uh, to uh, is that. Uh, there is actually structure there, and it is related to uh, generalized FZZ duality, or in other words, generalizing the generalized FZZ. This is something that Givon, Kutasov, and I did. So the idea there was that um, in the cigar case, um, yes, so in the cigar, what uh, the situation is that if you have modes that live all over this large supergravity regime, 
then each mode that lives here has a, a stringy fellow associated with it that lives at the tip. So FCZ showed this for a particular mode, and we showed that uh, there is the reason for that is basically this the underlying structure of SL2. And uh, the difference between uh, the cigar and the Lorentzian black hole from the SL2 uh, uh, um, point of view is just gauging. But this, this comes about basically from a feature that you have in SL2, so it should go down also, it should, some of it should survive when you go to Lorentzian black hole. And right now the best uh, thing that we can think of is that instead of having this Penrose diagram that is obviously smooth and I can cross the horizon at will, uh, there is a, a yo-yo, a stringy yo-yo that fills in all of that and basically the potential. So that yo-yo uh, comes, so you cannot just have this so, so the point about the, the FCZ and its generalization is that each gravity mode comes with a stringy mode. You cannot separate between them. And the same might be also here. This is a gravity mode, but the stringy mode that comes with it is something like that. And the structure that we see is basically due to that yo-yo and the details of that yo-yo solution and et cetera are, is something that we are um, you know, studying right now. So, uh, thank you. Yes. Um, analyticity is a really important assumption in what you're doing. Like how, like th this, all transformations of like, oh, taking X to I beta yes. uh, from one side to the other. So for instance, uh, this is something that a GR person might complain about. Like we do know the metric outside of the horizon, but how you analytically continue it to the other sides, it's well, if it's if not clear. Yes, so, 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 so for, right, yes. for rotating black holes, for instance, there's a right, lot of discussion. Right, what yes. happens in the inner horizon? Yes. And how do you, what yes. are the assumptions that you make? So, you so, it's, it's, it, uh, so I'm basically assuming, I'm basically assuming what, you know, that you can do this analytic continuation and that everything is fine crossing the horizon and going to the other regime. And then I see that, uh, well, if I made that assumption, then I encounter that problem. So, in a sense, you know, it's related, it's the same answer that I, I gave to me. You know, I'm assuming that everything is fine and I can do this analytic continuation. And then I see that I get this answer that seems to contradict uh, GR intuition. Firewall. Yes. This is all classical string theory. There is no quantum. Uh, but I mean, you had this picture of the rocket uh, having a. Yes, yes, yes. Is this meant to be a firewall, or is this? Uh, well, you know, I'm. Uh, oh, so you don't want to talk about it. I don't <laughs> care. You know, we can. You know, we can talk about firewalls forever. <laughs> I, I, I think that you know. Uh, let's uh, put it like that. I think that uh, uh, so there are many arguments why there should be a firewall um, right now, but. Uh, none of the arguments is telling you how come that there is a firewall. It's a very different statement, right? To know that there's something should be there if the information comes out, but none of them is telling you, you know, basically what is wrong with Hawking calculation that didn't find a firewall, okay? So uh, maybe, you know, something like that is the answer to that question. Maybe this is the reason why there is structure and this is what is causing uh, the firewall, but I'm not there yet. Yes. 